The original Legend of Zelda is an action-adventure game for the Nintendo Entertainment System, and I thought it would be fun to examine the assembly code behind combat with a focus on collision detection. The importance behind the timing of player input to on-screen attack response, the collision detection logic, and the number of frames involved in this process are among some of the most undervalued necessities to solid game design, in my opinion. As with all endeavors with the code behind old games, this required some research, and while researching this topic, I tumbled down the rabbit hole. There is a lot of code. At a glance, it would seem that keeping track of everything would prove difficult when you see how many numbers and subroutines are involved. It seemed a lot of note-taking was in order. Fortunately, there are a couple of features the emulator Messen has that really helped me with this endeavor. Using a debugger to set a breakpoint and then stepping through code to see the manipulation of a few RAM values is a good way to find the code responsible for a specific operation, but what if you need to keep track of multiple values across multiple subroutines? How would you keep it all straight as you step through so many lines of code? If you use the emulator's debugger feature to view the game's code, you can right-click on a line of code, select Edit Label, and comment the assembly code. With the region selected and the address specified, a comment can be left for that particular operation so it is easier to know what the code is doing as you step through it later on. Since this feature is available and Messen can save comments by exporting them to a file, I commented a rather large amount of combat code in the game. The accuracy of these comments is far from perfect, but wow, do they help me keep track of what is going on in a sea of assembly code. And the comments for this section of code, for example, help illustrate that there are a few items in the game with a usage conflict. Some of you Zelda veterans already know that there are item combinations that won't work together. F is used as an ID value for both the bait and the boomerang. How does that work? For the first pairing, use the bait, switch to the boomerang, throw it, and the bait disappears. Well, what about in opposite order? Throw the boomerang, switch to the bait, and you can't place it until the boomerang has returned. Of the two, the boomerang takes priority. This isn't simply a matter of a limit imposed on simultaneous item use, by the way. Link can throw the boomerang, fire the magic wand, place a bomb, and use a candle, and all the actions caused by all four items are still processed. For a sword projectile or magic shot from a magic wand, magic overrides the sword projectile. Shoot the sword and then use the wand and the sword projectile disappears. Use the wand and attempt to shoot the sword and the sword won't fire until the magic has dispersed. Two slots are shared by candle flames and bombs. Link cannot have any total combination of flames and bombs greater than two on screen simultaneously. If a bomb is placed and the candle is spammed, the bomb's smoke must dissipate before a second flame will appear. The ID associated with Link's sword is not used to represent any other items. The final two items that share a subroutine are the arrow and magic wand's melee attack. Yes, there is code to process striking an enemy with the magic wand, and boy is it ever broken. We'll touch a bit more on magic wand woes later. As for priority here, firing an arrow and then attempting to use the wand will lock you out of using the wand until the arrow has finished its path. Each of the subroutines for these item usage checks contains logic and branching to other subroutines to handle the state of the item in question, the range of the current weapon, weapon's position, enemy's position, and determining if the current enemy was hit. While the code can obviously handle all of this, it is a lot for us to juggle at the same time. To help keep track of the current enemy being processed, I used a second feature provided by Messen, Lua Scripting. Knowing RAM values and stepping through game code to see how they are used is very helpful, but the inclusion of a scripting language in the emulator lets us monitor values in a slightly more organized manner. Using an ancient programming technique called copy-paste-tweak-repeat, I wrote a script to place a large box over the status bar at the top of the screen and then added the object's index, followed by its ID, name, and health. All numeric values are in decimal. In addition to this, I used each object's coordinates to draw a box around the object using a color that matches the index listing at the top of the screen. With these features in place, it is easy to know which enemy I am attacking at any point, both on the screen and in RAM. Let's target an enemy, hit him with the sword, and walk the sword processing subroutine during the frame where the sword connected. The comments should help speed us through the code. Note that I am using a later revision of Zelda, the one that added the red caution box to the bottom of the continue save retry screen. 
If you would like to look at some of the same code shown in this video, just be aware that there are multiple versions of The Legend of Zelda. The ROM locations for these instructions, as well as the instructions themselves, might be different in your version. Also note that the graphics we see on screen at any moment in time are one frame behind the logic we are currently processing. This is by design. The graphics you see on screen are always the result of the logic performed during the last frame. For example, Link pulls his shield to the side and puts his hand out in front of him before the sword appears. The logic we will step through for the first frame of a sword strike that collides with an enemy is taking place before the sword is actually drawn to the screen. Our logic has to set up what will be drawn the next frame. So this is what will actually be on screen in the emulator while we process hit detection. For the sake of our trace, however, I will put a few of the result graphics that would appear in the next frame as it is easier to talk about collision detection if you actually see the sword. So just know that I am customizing the graphics on screen a little bit in order to help explain what is happening. Now onto our trace. If I strike this blue moblin in the light blue box, we know that our object index is 2. Let's use him for our target. The code I have placed on the screen is the main loop for object processing. The value stored in memory location 340 hex contains the number of objects, or enemies, remaining to be processed. Our loop begins by loading the current value into X. Our code will constantly reference X throughout these subroutines, so it knows which RAM locations to check for various traits for the current enemy we are checking for item use collision. If you look at the bottom of this window, you can see that after all of the code in the middle has been executed, the total number of objects to process has 1 subtracted from it, and the code will loop back to our statement at ECDE to continue processing if our object index hasn't reached 0 yet, that is, if we still have enemies to process. An easy loop. For our trace, we will start right here at address ED0B, a statement that jumps us into the item usage subroutine. I set a breakpoint for execution to stop at this address when our object index is 2, which ties it to this specific moblin on the screen, and Link also has used his sword. We'll pick it up from this point once these conditions have been met. Throughout this trace you will notice that the code stores values in a few of the earliest locations in RAM. Zelda uses them as working storage and alters the values many times per frame. We will use quite a few of these when processing collision detection, and I will keep track of them down here. Since we are going to be dealing with pixel distances, it is easier if the values are in decimal instead of hexadecimal. The code will use hexadecimal values of 0 through F, of course. When I record the references down here, I'll convert them to decimal values we are used to using, 0 through 9, to make the math easier to follow. Now let's resume execution and enter the subroutine. The first thing we do is immediately jump to somewhere else, 7A2D, so let's step into it. This subroutine takes the enemy's screen location in X and Y coordinates, adds 8 to each of them, and stores those new values in memory locations 2 and 3. Most enemies in Zelda fit in an area made up of 16 pixels by 16 pixels. By adding a hard-coded value of 8 to each coordinate, the logic is recording a center point offset for enemy collision detection and saving those values in RAM. Let's execute these statements and get back to the item use subroutine. There are a few lines here that check a couple of enemy flags. I didn't bother to trace these. Both of them skip item use processing, so they aren't relevant to our current trace. Now we've reached the official start of item processing. The value for a possible item is loaded into Y and the paired subroutine executed. This same process repeats for the other item use possibilities. We looked at this section just a moment ago. Our interest? This one, the sword processing subroutine. Let's step over the other item checks to get to the sword section. With a value of D and register Y to ID a possible sword attack, we enter the sword check subroutine. Each subroutine saves the possible action ID in memory location 00. Our sword routine starts by doing the same. A couple of lines later, that Y value is used as an offset, right here, to pull a sword-related value from B9 and store it in the accumulator A. What is B9? It is the current state of our used item, in this case, Link's sword. And now, we've reached code I'd like to examine a bit closer. The B9 value we just pulled and the two lines of code that follow. Let's step away from the code walk for a moment. 
The items that Link uses have different states during their operation. As we know, several items share IDs used by the item processing subroutine and won't allow those items to coexist with each other in the action window. They also share the same RAM offset used for storing the item states. Adding the ID value to the base address of AC will indicate the state for that item. In our current sword logic, the sword state is stored at location B9 and, just like the other items, contains a value of 0 when not in use. Well, we just used the sword, what state values will we see at location B9? When the A button is pressed, the sword state progresses through the following values. 1 for 4 frames. I call this the sword windup. 2 for 8 frames. The sword is in use during this frame. Each of these frames is a potential sword collision frame. 3 for 1 frame. The sword is starting to retract after the stab. 4 for 1 frame. The sword is still retracting but is closer to Link now. And 5 for 1 frame. The sword has been retracted. Probably 1 frame of wait time before the next possible sword use input. After this, the sword state would return to 0, not in use. The player can attack again and the process would repeat. The code we were walking through takes the sword state stored in B9, loads it into the accumulator A, and then compares it to a value of 2. The value of 2 makes sense here as we know that 2 is the value of the sword state when it is stabbing forward. It is in this state for 8 frames and can only collide with an enemy during those frames. This conceptually makes sense, but what about the assembly code here? What do we mean by compare with this CMP statement? Most programming languages are going to have some form of comparing two values that include equal to, not equal to, greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, that sort of thing. Examples like these are typically used to say, hey, if this condition is met, then do something. In assembly language, this if-then is accomplished with two instructions and the approach is different than a traditional if-then. The two values are compared to each other, and the various stats that describe the relationship of those numbers are indicated by the CPU's status flags. The state of those flags allows the next statement to take action based on their values, the results from the compare. The next statement is typically a branch statement. A branch operation takes us somewhere else in the code if the branch conditions have been met. So what is a compare statement actually doing? There has to be math involved, right? Yes. The actual mathematical operation performed on a CMP statement is a subtraction. It is the accumulator A minus the value at a memory address, or simply minus a specified value. The subtraction is done just so the CPU can set the appropriate flags with the findings based on the operation. So how does this subtraction relate to the CPU flags? This table pairs traditional results from relating two numbers on the left with how those results are related via flags on the right. A 0 means the flag is clear, a 1 means it is set. For example, the third line shows that if the accumulator A was greater than the compared value, then the 0 flag is clear and the carry flag is set after the compare operation was executed. Now that we have flags that are clear or set after our compare, we can take action using a branch statement. Here are four examples of branch instructions along with their descriptions. The first line shows that branch if equal will branch to another place in code if the zero flag is set. I included an if then translation on the far right for convenience. Having reference charts to help wrap your head around using CPU flags when comparing numbers is certainly useful, but no matter what, it does take a bit of practice to get used to this approach. I omitted the negative flag from this explanation and there are more conditions and therefore more branch statements than just these four. but. Hopefully, this much alone helps explain the tag-team relationship between compare and branch statements by way of CPU flags. Fortunately, Messen has a feature to help keep track of all of this. Mousing over the assembly instructions will pop up a quick reminder of what the selected instruction is and what it does. CMP puts a red box around the status flags that are affected after execution. BNE reminds us that it is looking to see if the zero flag is clear so it will branch. Now the breakdown. Load our sword state into A. Compare it to 2. 2 minus 2 is 0. The 0 flag is set to indicate the numbers are equal. B and E, branch if not equal, does not branch to 7D25. We continue with the next instruction. Translation? If Link's sword is not stabbing forward, get out of here. Branch to 7D25. Otherwise, continue with sword versus enemy.
I went into detail about this compare and branch relationship because this pair will haunt us in a different section of code a bit later in this video. Let's pick the code up after B and E. Which sword is Link using? Use it to find an offset containing damage dealt and store potential sword damage in memory address 07. By the way, the lookup values for the damage are stored nearby, just above our current subroutine, and they appear to match what the manual told us so long ago. If you wanted to push the melee-based damage of Link's sword up a lot, these are the values you would alter. The next block of code looks to see what direction Link is facing and creates the sword's hit range. If Link is facing north or south, the range is 12 pixels across the horizontal in both directions and 16 across the vertical in both directions. If he is facing east or west, those numbers are swapped. 0D is used to store the weapon's east-west reach, and 0E is used to store its north-south reach. In our example, Link is facing south, so the vertical axis gets the larger value of the two. After that, we jump to 7DD1. This subroutine loads up Link's attack type and the direction he is facing into Y and A respectively, and then finds the center point for the weapon he is using. Just as we found the center point of the blue moblin we are attacking, so also do we find the center point of Link's weapon, in this case a sword. The sword is taller than it is wide, so different values are used to find the center point. These values are swapped depending on if the sword is facing north-south or east-west. In our case, the longer axis is the y-axis, so the center of the sword is considered to be the sword's x-axis location plus 6 pixels and the y-axis location plus 8 pixels. Take note that the plotted center point does not appear to be in the center of Link's blade. The weapon's x-position center is stored in 04, we jump to 7BE2, and the y-position is stored in 05. Memory location 06 is zeroed out here. It will be incremented if Link hit an enemy. We once again load the state of Link's sword from B9 and make sure something was happening with it. We continue and jump into the collision detection subroutine 7DFF. We are finally ready to determine if the current blue moblin in Object Index 2 was hit by Link's sword. 6 is cleared again. Sword melee attack identifier is placed in Y. The enemy's centered X position is placed in A. Our collision detection begins with the weapon's center X location versus the enemy's center X location. The two values are subtracted from one another. If the number is negative, it doesn't matter. This subroutine 701F returns the absolute value. So now we have a number that represents the x-axis distance between where Link's weapon's center point is and where the current enemy's center point is. It is stored in 0A. Now for x-axis collision detection. The distance we just calculated is compared to the value stored for the weapon's horizontal range from center. Is the distance between the weapon's center location and the enemy's center location less than the x-axis attack range from the weapon center? If it isn't, there is no point in checking the y-axis values we bail from the subroutine with no collision. If it is within range, like in our example here, we perform the same check on the y-axis and store the result in 0B. If the attack isn't also within y-axis range, we leave the subroutine. However, if it is within range, we hit the enemy. We finally confirmed weapon collision with this blue moblin. Memory location 06 is incremented to signal a collision, and we return from our collision detection subroutine. From here, there is some code to begin looking into some specifics. If we were fighting a dark nut, did we hit his shield, etc. Eventually, damage is applied, health values are updated, and enemy death and item drops are handled if necessary. There is your relatively short walk through collision detection for the sword. A few questions, perhaps. First question, how much CPU time did it take to walk through all of the weapon checks and then process the sword subroutine up to the confirmed collision with the sword for this moblin? Specifically, the code executed from ED0B to 7E21 via various code jumps. We measure time in seconds, minutes, etc. The Nintendo uses CPU cycles to determine how much time has passed. With all of these numbers present, we want to know the number of cycles it took to run all of those CPU instructions we just stepped through and calculate a percentage for a single frame. 
The emulator keeps track of cycle count, and I recorded the cycle count from before executing our first statement to enter the item use subroutine, as well as the cycle count from just after executing our last statement to set the collision confirmed flag. Subtract them and we get a cycle count of 614 cycles. 614 divided by 29780 for one frame is 2% of total frame time. Of course, that 29780 can be explained using a much more detailed breakdown involving time devoted to logic work, graphic work, video output, vertical blank time, etc. But the key point here is that the code we walked didn't take too much time to execute. In seconds, you're looking at 614 divided by the NES clock speed of 1.78 million cycles per second to get an operation time of just over 0 .00034 seconds. Not bad. Assuming the numbers I just crunched are correct, of course. Second question, what about enemy size? We didn't really deal with enemy size in our calculation, did we? It was a pixel distance calculation between center points, and the enemy center point was that enemy's location plus 8 pixels for each axis. How does that work? You could think of The Legend of Zelda as being boxed based, and more often than not, as mentioned earlier, enemies are 16 by 16. We can use the script window to draw collision boxes for both Link's sword and this blue moblin. How big should the boxes be? Since collision is based on distance between center points, weapon versus enemy, I suppose we could draw a rectangle around the weapon's center point using the north, south, and east, west sizes to determine the box. Collision would occur when the enemy's center point is inside the box. However, I would rather have hitboxes on both the sword and the enemy and use box overlap to illustrate if collision occurred. So how about we cut each of the range values in half and put one half around the sword and the other half around the enemies on the screen? To me, that makes it easier to observe distance with a freeze frame. The borders from each box represent half the range. When the borders share space, the distance between center points is equal to the range, no hit. As soon as the borders overlap on both axes, a hit is registered. As mentioned earlier, the center point of the sword box is not centered on the sword despite the fact the blade is 3 pixels wide. I added a green pixel to show the sword's original coordinates prior to finding the center point offset. The center is 6 pixels to the right and 8 pixels down, the same pixel count we traced earlier. Although a single pixel may not make that much of a difference, it seems like perhaps 7 pixels to the right would have made more sense here. When Link is facing east-west, the attack greatly favors his upper half as the center point is a couple of pixels above the blade. He is more likely to hit a nearby enemy if the enemy is above his location versus below his location on screen. Let's take a look at a few other enemies. Manhandler is 5 16x16 16 16 blocks. Using the sword to produce hitboxes shows the rectangles are present on each piece. If you are familiar with this enemy, you know that all but the part in the center box have their own health and will register damage. Gliok is one example of a special case in terms of blocks. He needs a lot more than the typical object indices can provide and uses extra locations in RAM to keep track of his heads and necks. Let's take a look at Ganon, the final boss of the game. He is invisible and moves about the room, requiring Link to stab his sword into the air and attempt to find him. After Ganon has been stabbed several times and changes color, a silver arrow is used to finish him off. As far as movement, it would seem that Ganon just transports around the room and throws projectiles at Link. He uses different code than the standard enemies when it comes to his size and center point. I manually compensated for this in the Lua script by sizing his object box to 32 by 32. If we enable the script, you can see that Ganon actually slides around the room. He doesn't just jump to each location. When I strike with my sword, you'll no doubt notice that the range used in collision detection is still the same as it was for the other enemies. Ganon's hitbox is nowhere close to his overall size. If I freeze him in place and attempt to stab him with my sword, you can see how much overlap there is with the sword hitbox and the orange box Ganon occupies. The hitbox tells the tale, Link must still perform a sword strike within the standard 12x16 or 16x12 pixel range. The distance between the two center points must still be less than each of those values for the respective axes. Naturally, there is no reason why Link's sword should be any longer when fighting Ganon. The point here is that Ganon is not made up of four separate boxes, each with its own center point for collision detection like Manhandla. He has just a single center point for the collision detection. This is all trivial, of course, as striking Ganon is done when he is invisible. Music
Among the items Link can use is the Magic Wand, aka Magical Rod. The wand deals damage in three ways. Alone, it shoots magic across the screen. When paired with the magic book, the spells turn into fire when contact is made with enemies or the magic hits the edge of the screen. The third method of attack is to use the wand as a melee weapon by striking enemies with it. And with this approach comes a rather strange bug. If I walk to the bottom of this screen with wand in hand, face the wall, and continue to mash the B button to use the wand, what will happen to the darknet enemies in this room? Anything? You'd think that none of them would receive any damage and Link would be in big trouble. However, some take damage and fly across the screen as if they took damage from above. Why? What is happening? I did a bit of a code trace through the wand melee and arrow subroutine and I didn't really see anything that seemed out of the ordinary, at least not during my first pass. The code honestly sets up a wand melee attack along with the damage and then jumps to the sword subroutine to start setting the weapon's range. Aside from setting weapon ID and damage, logic just picks up and follows the sword subroutine. Efficient. My eyes moved away from code and into RAM so I could watch number behavior and I noticed something rather odd. Upon using the magic wand, the Y-axis location of the wand pulls back 27 pixels above its eventual attack position. The sword and wand land in the same spot, but the wand has that kickback during windup. Upon making this observation, I knew what the bug was that was causing the magic wand to deal melee damage where, and more specifically when, it shouldn't be, and came up with a very likely explanation as to why. The damage was occurring immediately after pressing the B button to use the wand. If the wand had wind-up time like the sword, the damage was probably being dealt too early, during wind-up time. If we follow the value at RAM location BE, the arrow and wand animation state, the wand rolls through the values like this when used. 31 for 4 frames, the wand wind up. 32 for 8 frames, the wand is out in front of Link. 33 for 1 frame, 34 for 1 frame, and 35 for 1 frame. Wand retraction and perhaps a 1 frame delay before Link can use it again. It matches the behavior of the sword frame for frame. Truth be told, this was what made me bother to script hitboxes for the weapon and the enemy. I wanted to see the box locations on screen when I used the wand. The results help justify the next part of my realization. The box appears above Link's head when facing east, above and slightly more centered when facing west, and directly above his head when facing south. My guess is that the XY location code is left over from an earlier time in development during which the wind-up frames had more of a graphical presence on screen. Perhaps Link was literally going to hold the wand over his head before using it in the direction he was facing. An exception would be, of course, when he was facing north. With 4 frames of pre-attack, it is possible the wand would jump from above Link for 4 frames to in front of Link for 8 frames. As for the centering above his head being different depending on if he was facing east or west, I have no explanation. Perhaps the XY positioning code for placing the wand above Link was incomplete anyway. Continuing with speculation, it is possible his sword attack could have had similar animation for those 4 frames. There are pre-attack animations present in Link to the Past and Link's Awakening that show a slicing method of sword attack rather than the simple stab of the first game. There are also three angles of sword sprites available in the first Zelda. Vertical, horizontal, and angled. The angled sword is used to represent the magical sword in inventory and set it apart from the other two swords. If Nintendo had used an over-the-top sword slash from above Link to in front of him, it is possible they would have used sword sprites drawn at an angle as part of the attack animation. Was this graphic only meant to set the best sword apart from the others inside the A box in the status bar, or was it originally intended to be used as part of a swinging animation that was abandoned? I feel that this wand over the head position change lends credence to the possibility. So what are some of the code items that we could change to perhaps tighten up combat in The Legend of Zelda? The most notable oddity in my opinion is the wand melee bug. Speedrunners are well aware of this and exploit it as needed. If we wanted to fix it, we should take a look at the wand and arrow subroutine. The problem is most likely with this area here. The code compares the arrow and wand state memory location BE to 30 hex and then branches if the results include a carry flag that is clear. The carry flag is clear if the arrow and wand's value is less than 30 hex. The breakdown for the arrow and wand melee values looks like this. The code skips ahead to process arrow possibilities if the state is less than 30. 
If therefore the state is over 30, meaning a wand attack, then the subroutine begins collision detection for the wand. The problem with this, of course, is that 31 hex is a wand-related value, but is the wind-up value for the wand. If the wand melee attack is meant to mimic a sword attack, the collision should only occur for 8 frames when the wand's state is equal to 32 hex. We could increase the value used in the compare statement to an item state of 32 hex, and the melee attack would not collide with enemies until the wand is in use and in front of Link. But this would also mean that the wand retraction states of 33 to 35 hex would also collide with the enemy as they are greater than 32. Therefore, I feel the correction should include changing 30 hex to 32 hex in the compare statement and also changing the branch statement from BCC to BNE, branch if not equal. That would mean all arrow and wand state values except a wand melee attack of 32 hex would branch to 7D70. The attack code would only be used with a wand melee attack of 32 hex. As an alternative to patching the ROM, code changes can also be applied to the game by way of two game genie codes. Let's try out the change. The wand works quite well. The melee damage is the same as striking an enemy with the white sword, and the magic projectile is always there regardless of Link's health. After collecting the magic book, the magic turns into fire when Link hits an enemy or the edge of the screen. While this isn't very beginner friendly, it does allow for a potential new strategy when using the wand. A single B button press could damage enemies in two different directions relative to Link. The buggy version of the melee attack has been around a long time of course, and many of you may not want to change it, or never plan on using the magic wand as a melee weapon anyway. I doubt Nintendo would ever patch an old game for something as trivial as this, but if they did, hey, this change seems to work. Finally, let's talk about wind-up time. I'll focus on the sword. We know that Link has four frames of wind-up before the sword actually appears. The value for the state of the sword during wind-up is 1. This value is set, by the way, at location 8E1B. If I change the starting value to 2, the four-frame wind-up is removed. Link can strike immediately. The difference in timing is easier to demonstrate in a video by using Turbo. Collision detection occurs immediately after the button press. Some may feel that Zelda has input lag, however, it is definitely wind-up by design. With the wind-up eliminated, Link does strike his enemies a lot faster than by default. Enemies that require multiple strikes, especially when Link attacks them with the first sword in the game, aren't vanquished as easily with the faster sword attack as one might think, as the enemies still have that same temporary invulnerability timer used for recovery. So perhaps reducing enemy recovery time would also help make a faster sword attack be worth it. One could potentially shorten Link's recovery time and speed up movement for both Link and the enemies. That would certainly increase the overall difficulty of the game. Truly, the give and take for the timing of game combat is both an art and a science for developers. I hope you've enjoyed this peek into the sword and wand combat logic in The Legend of Zelda. I have a few other ideas for behind the code videos for The Legend of Zelda, so keep your eyes open. As always, thanks for watching.